All right, good afternoon and welcome to this week's Iowa Learning Farms Conservation Webinar. I am Matt Helmers with Iowa State University and uh, happy to host the webinar uh, this week. Glad to be back hosting. And we're really fortunate uh, this week to have uh, Brooke Wilkie coming to us from the Kellogg Biological Station in Michigan. And Brooke is gonna talk to us today about designing cropping systems for efficiency environmental performance, and more profit. Uh, so I think all encompassing um, uh, talk about, about this, and he, he mentioned that he has a lot of pictures in here. So I think uh, hopefully visually stimulating for, for all of us on a nice uh, Wednesday afternoon. Uh, as always, if you have uh, questions as Brooke goes through the talk, feel free to type those in the chat box and we'll get those to Brooke at the end of the talk. So with that, uh, Brooke, the virtual floor is all yours. Thank you, Matt. Um, I assume you can hear me okay. I switched my yep. headphones. Yep, I can hear you great. Okay, great. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to be here. I grew up in Nebraska, and obviously now I'm in Michigan with the Kellogg Biological Station, and so I drive through Iowa a lot and observe the landscape, um, and so excited to be here uh, talking with you about what we're learning in Michigan and how it could potentially translate to the whole upper Midwest. <clears throat> so if you're not familiar, the Kellogg Biological Station is in southwest Michigan. We're affiliated with Michigan State University, and we have a pretty large land base where we do agroecology research, um, bioenergy, dairy, uh, and also some just more basic ecology, evolutionary biology research. Uh, and that includes a lot of long-term projects. So we're fortunate to have the resources to invest in some long-term projects that really focus on agroecology and row crop or bioenergy systems. And so I come at this presentation with a lens from where we're at, um, but I think you'll find that some of the things I talk about are probably translatable to many places throughout our entire upper Midwest region. I am officially a part uh, or employed by, and we are a part of the Long-Term Agroecosystem Research Network, which uh, a shout out, we have partners in Iowa um, that are part of the Upper Mississippi River Basin um, location for the LTAR network. Uh, we are a location in Michigan, and there are 18 sites across the country that represent various cropland and grazing ecosystems. Um, really trying to study and evaluate and develop national strategies for sustainable intensification of agricultural production. And so we're doing our work couched in the context of that network, um, but also, you know, localized for what we're doing. Now, part of the network and also very important for us is that we're doing our research on cropping systems with a focus on stakeholder needs so that we aren't just going out and designing research projects purely based on what we think is important as scientists, but we're really listening to stakeholders and we're really trying to reinvent the way we do some of this research in collaboration with stakeholders of all, all types of um, people that work in various facets of agriculture, from farmers to NGOs to policymakers and so forth. And give them a platform to engage with us in developing the research and then telling people what we've what we're up to now one of the major goals of this ltar project is to develop an aspirational system and in the croplands obviously it, it includes row crops that are common in the region other sites have grazing um, systems that their aspirational systems would be couched in that and so we are developing this system or we have developed this system and in many ways we are further developing it and we're testing it compared to normal typical status quo farming of the region so what are we what are we looking for in this aspirational cropping system well what we've heard from from our stakeholder partners and also agreeable with scientists is we're really looking for production efficiencies. We need to keep producing our, our grains, but we need to be more efficient at it. When we're growing our crops, we need to mitigate greenhouse gases as much as possible. There's a lot of research going into that space. Um, we want to promote more biodiversity. 
So providing places within and around our cropping systems that can enhance biodiversity, both for intrinsic benefit and also to benefit our own cropping system. We need to be resilient to changing climate and weather extremes that are, are becoming more common or, you know, there's always been those issues, but they're becoming more common. I'm going to talk a little bit about a mini drought that we had this spring. We obviously want to improve soil health. A lot of our work nationwide is working on improving soil health for the benefit of the farmer and the soil. We need to protect our water. Uh, that's something that resonates across the whole Midwest. For us, um, we're a little more concerned with nitrogen leaching into groundwater and phosphorus loss to our freshwater lakes. You might be a little bit more concerned in Iowa about uh, nitrogen loss to the waterways and the rivers and so forth. All is relevant. And then, of course, all of this needs to be done in a way that farmers can still be profitable and and happy and their communities be happy. So our stakeholder team designed a cropping system that would uh, try to achieve these needs. And this cropping system included a lot of diversity. So we have five different crops in rotation. We're trying to cycle nutrients within the system and have efficient nutrient use. Uh, we're integrating animals so that we can grow forages, um, potentially have grazing and then manure application that aids in our circularity goals. We wanna keep something growing all the time if we can. So forever green, meaning we have cover crops in between the cash crops and we fit in some perennials where we can. We're gonna stop farming the really low yielding areas and plant them to prairie instead of just farming them with the forever hope that we're gonna do better on those areas, which some areas we can heal and fix, but other areas we can't. Uh, we're gonna avoid tillage. Uh, we wanna be adaptive, which is unique in a long-term experiment. We wanna have some flexibility to make decisions on the fly. And then we want to use precision agriculture to apply variable rate inputs and other technologies as they arise to be um, best suited to be as efficient as possible and use data. So this, my presentation is going to be talking about how, like the specifics of how we design this and what we're learning uh, over time. It kind of looks like this, a drawing that a, a local artist did for us, um, where the aspirational cropping system that we designed is on top and we've placed crops on the system, but you can see we have corn, soybean, wheat, canola, and then a forage crop, a perennial forage crop in that five-year system. And we are comparing it in an experimental context to a business as usual system, which um, Across the upper Midwest, primarily the most common system is corn and soybeans in rotation with minimal, um, you know, no cover crops, um, tillage and commercial practices. Um, Michigan is a pretty diverse agricultural state, but still about 50% of our acres are in just a corn soybean rotation. And it's higher than that in many places around the Midwest. So this experiment we started in 2022. And just a little snapshot of what our experimental design looks like. The map on the left of your screen, I think it's showing up on the left of your screen, is a map of KBS and the fields that are colored are part of this experiment. And total, we have 300 acres that are either in aspirational or business as usual farming. And then that includes fields that are a little bit larger, up to about 35 acres in size. And then we have plots that are about just over a half acre in size with replication. So we can study all these, these crops and the systems in detail. It gives us a really great platform to develop this cropping system, um, update it over time as we find you know ways we can improve it, and then also... Um, compare it over the long term to uh, sort of status quo farming systems. Um, so I'm going to take you year by year through um, this aspirational system. We're really not going to talk about the business as usual. We're just going to talk about aspirational, what it looks like, what the goods are. And also, I really want to point out what the challenges are, because we're finding that as we push forward towards, you know, what we perceive as a a system that can have an overall better set of outcomes for our farmers and for our ecosystems, it's not easy. And there are new challenges that arise. And so I don't want to sugarcoat it saying everything's great, right? In many ways, everything is great, but there are also new challenges. So I, I definitely want to get through that. 
So um, year by year, okay, year one of our aspirational system, you could start anywhere, but we're going to start with corn. So when we grow corn, we have a perennial forage that's growing, and then we no-till um, with herbicides terminate that, and then we plant corn right into the cover crop, the remaining biomass, and then we're going to interseed cover crops into it and interseed some or plant some more cover crops after about the end of the corn growing season. Meanwhile, we're applying some compost or manure up front, and then we're considering how can we use sort of the residues and the cover crop for cattle feed at the end of the corn growing season. So a few pictures of what this kind of looks like. Here's um, clover alfalfa field that is going dormant in the fall, and we're starting to apply some composted manure to it. Uh, and we're not incorporating it. We're just applying it on the surface. The next spring, we'll come through and make a decision about whether we want to plant right into this cover crop, something like this, and then terminate the cover crop after planting, or if we want to terminate a little bit early and then plant the cover crop, that's still something that, well, it's not something we're working out. It's something that is important to consider every year, primarily based on your water availability and, and whether you can get the corn growing or not. Um, if you plant green, into this living cover crop. Um, some years we might have a corn crop that looks like this, it's thriving corn. This is actually a picture here of interseeding cover crops into corn uh, when it's about cl getting close to waist high. So we've had um, in our sh relatively short time of, of evaluating this system, we've had successful years where the corn looks great. Um, we've had really high yields. I, this is a yield map from one of our fields last year. This is, that's not part of the experiment proper, but it's basically testing the same method where we planted green, that picture that I showed you, and then only applied 60 pounds of nitrogen and we still had yields um, in parts of the field in excess of 275 bushels per acre of corn, even when you do something like that. And I repeat, only 60 pounds of nitrogen per acre added. And so you can get a lot of nitrogen credit, you can grow a lot of corn. Now, this year, uh, we killed the cover crop and then we planted corn and it didn't rain for like six weeks. I mean, very, very little rain. And so here's a picture of our corn crop that you can, if you squint, you can barely see the rows of corn coming up. Um, but it's kind of hard to see a row coming there. And a few of the, the plants that were in our forage mix um, still growing in between the rows, but it was dry. But the corn plants were there and they eventually came out of it and started growing, but they're way behind um, our corn that we planted in more using more conventional practices. Regardless of um, what we did this spring, everything with the corn is behind and patchy in a lot of spots because of that really dry weather in mid-May through June. Um, and so managing the corn when you're planting into a really heavy cover crop is really critical so that you get it right, you have moisture to get those seeds growing and keep them alive until rain returns, um, but certainly a risk. And, and we can manage that, but just by how early we terminate the cover crop, depending on what the risk we want to embody with how much moisture that cover crop would remove from the soil versus how much nitrogen we want to grow in the, in the crop. Uh, we use precision ag as much as we can as a combination of yield maps, soil maps, um, satellites, airplanes, drones to create as much data on a particular field as we can. And then uh, in the bottom right hand corner is a, a yield map. We got a drone flying above the corn here. Um, and then we're applying our nitrogen um, using split applications and variable rate technologies, keeping in mind we're reducing our nitrogen rates in total because we're crediting the cover crop and the manure applications. And so, for example, this year, we're applying less than half of the nitrogen to our aspirational cropping system corn compared to the conventional practices. And we still expect to have enough nitrogen out there to optimize yields. We're interseeding cover crops into this um, corn as well. And that's about when the corn is knee to waist high, as I showed that one picture. And we've done this quite a bit over the last few years. In some cases, you get a great cover crop that looks like this, 
Um, it doesn't always look like that, I'll tell you, because the corn can be competitive with the cover crop. And, um, and sometimes moisture just matters if you don't have moisture at the right time to get the cover crop growing. But in many cases, we get at least some cover crop growing between the corn rows. Of course, if you wanted to hedge your bets, you could grow corn in wider rows. We've done some wide row corn, but we do experience yield losses when we do that. So we don't want to put all of our apples into that necessarily because corn yield is important. And as long as we can get some cover crop growing, that's um, beneficial. In many cases, it looks something like this, where you've got a few radish plants or clover plants here and there in between the corn rows. Um, and they grow really well where the corn isn't doing very well. And that's that's important to us that we can at least have something growing where um, maybe the corn isn't. And it's something that's not weeds, per se. So that's important. Um, and then we come through at the end of the corn year and we add some rye um, to the, the mix or to the field, either with an airplane or broadcast in before the corn is harvested or right after the corn is harvested so that we kind of have some cover crop up front, but not all the cover crop. And then we bring in rye at the end so that we for sure get rye established. So going into the next um, year, we have soybeans. And again, ideally, we have cover crop and then soy, oops, advance here, cover crop, soybeans growing, and then harvested and then wheat planting afterwards. And a little, a few pictures here, um, you can do something like this, plant into heavy, tall cover crop um, uh, of rye or other things. And usually the soybeans do pretty well in this case. Some years when we roll down the cover crop, we get really great looking soybeans, maybe like this. Now in other years, we might have something that looks like this. And this is this year. And you can see kind of the middle to left half of the screen is sort of brown and no soybeans there, although there were soybeans planted. And over here, there's a lot of soybeans. Well, this was terminated early on the right side of the page. In the middle to the left was terminated at planting. And we struggle both with vole damage, voles eating the soybeans because they hide in that residue and really thrive in there and then they eat all the soybeans is usually pretty spotty. Um, and we also can risk more moisture competition from the cover crop. So we're working on ways, again, terminating the cover crop early is a way to mitigate some of that risk of having the cover crop. But as you have the cover crop growing longer, you can get more benefit, but you embody more risk. All right, fast forward to the fall. We've got soybeans getting harvested in a field. Um, many of you have seen that, that's nothing new. We come through as soon as we can with wheat planting. So winter wheat um, uh, residue management of the soybeans is important. So you have it evenly spread and you don't have bunches of residue. That's easier said than done. The third year of this system, uh, looks sort of like this. We've got wheat that grows up and is harvested by mid to early July. And then well, what are we doing here? The cover crop is um, we harvest the wheat, we bale the straw, and then we plant cover crop right away. Have about two months of growing a fast growing cover crop. And then we mow that and harvest it for forage. And then we plant canola. And winter canola, we'll get to that um, bringing some new challenges, but winter wheat or other small grains, winter small grains are really crucial to getting us to a next step in our cropping system. In Michigan, we do really well with growing wheat compared to most places around the country. Um, it's beautiful. It's growing in the early spring when we have plenty of moisture. Uh, it harvests uh, this, just this week, we're harvesting a lot of wheat in Michigan. Some last week, there's a picture of prairie strip in the middle of the field. We'll get to that. It's pretty reliable. However, here's the, the challenge. Quality, winter wheat has to achieve quality. And this is a picture of barley, just to exemplify. But two things we run into. One is wheat and barley can both sprout and then be rendered less valuable at the, in the marketplace or not valuable at all. And we can um, get vomit toxin contamination, which also makes it unsellable into the human food market. And so there are risks. 
these can be managed, um, but it is a challenge nonetheless to consider. After wheat is really where our box gets opened up. I'm going to cycle through these pretty quick, but we can do a number of things. We can double crop soybeans, especially if we have barley and, and especially if we have water to grow the soybeans. We can double crop with things like sunflowers or sorghum, especially if it's forage. We can grow lots of cover crops. Radishes are common, uh, mixed with oats sometimes in Michigan. We can grow legumes like hairy vetch or red clover and grow a lot of nitrogen for our next crop. We can even consider doing something like precision cover cropping where we have rows of cover crop planted deliberately where we want it and not and other species where we, you know, they can have different benefit. Here's hairy vetch and rye and rows instead of just mixed together. We can grow a diversity of cover crops. We can graze those cover crops or harvest them for forage. Lots of possibilities, and it all involves growing plants in our fields that are going to have some value, right? And it's a great opportunity. Now, in our system, we are growing a sorghum sedan base cover crop, and it gets to be about this big in the one and a half to two months. It might grow a little bigger than this. One and a half to two months, we have it growing out there. And then we are harvesting it, taking it off the field, storing it for cattle feed, and then we're coming in immediately and planting canola along with a, an herbicide application to terminate weeds and the sorghum, the, the sorghum sedan cover crop. If you look carefully, you can see little tiny canola plants coming up. Now, if anybody's grown canola, you know, they're pretty vulnerable when they're coming up. Um, they're pretty small seeds, small seedlings. And if you do it right, you can get a pretty good stand of canola that planted in mid to late September over winters and is primed and ready to go. Now, we also have scenarios where we know slugs love to eat canola as they do other crops in no-till high residue systems. I don't know if there's a problem in Iowa, but it's a problem here and further east. And so we're currently battling how do we stop the slugs from eating all of our canola? Not, they didn't eat all of it, but they eat a lot of it, and it is damaging. So we're working on that um, as a next stage of, of how we, you know, get through this and keep winter canola in our system. Assuming we get it to survive, which I'd say about 75% of our winter canola survived, it is an amazing crop. It is flowering by mid-May. Here's May 13th this year. In full bloom, people drive by. They're like, what is that? It is beautiful. I don't know what it is. Um, and they tell them it's canola, and they still have to connect the dots to canola oil in a bottle. But um, it's beautiful. Uh, it's kind of finishes flowering by, oh, late May. And then it continues to fill pods. And it looks like this when it's getting close to harvest. Actually, we've got a combine out here harvesting canola today. We expect yields that are similar to soybeans, maybe slightly lower. Price for canola is a little bit higher than soybeans, so it kind of balances out. After the canola is harvested, we come in and plant a diverse mixture of forage crops that is intended for to be short-lived. This is red clover, alfalfa, plant, uh, chicory, not plantain, chicory, and annual ryegrass. And you can see here, canola regrowth is happening with the forage coming up underneath. And most of that canola will winter kill um, going into the next year. The final year, we have this perennial forage that we harvest, you know, either grazing or mechanically um, throughout the year, just like you would an alfalfa crop. But we've got a diversity of species in there. I'm quickening my pace here because I'm going to run out of time. Um, this is what it looks like first cutting of that forage harvest in the spring. There's a lot of forage there. One unique thing about red clover is that it is it, it flowers like two weeks after you cut it in the middle of the summer and attracts a lot of pollinators, whereas alfalfa doesn't do that. And so we're excited to have red clover in the mix to attract those pollinators. And of course, we can graze that crop if we want to, although grazing presents, you know, additional challenges of getting cows out there versus mechanical harvesting. Um, we're, we're interested to learn how important either of those are. And then we go back into corn again. So that's our five-year rotation. Now, I'm about out of time, but I do want, I got just got a few more slides here to go through this topic, prairie strips. 
Prairie Strips came, our idea came from Iowa. So kudos to you all there that are involved in Prairie Strips. We have a little bit different reason for valuing them. Um, water quality concerns, overland flow aren't as great here as they are in Iowa, but we are concerned about biodiversity. We are concerned about our low yielding areas and planting them to crops instead of um, planting them to something that's not crops that we're going to not lose money on. So we're taking every field that's in this experiment and evaluating it historically. Where are the low yielding areas of the field? Um, dividing it into stability zones with the help of the Basso Lab at MSU and placing prairie strategically where we can farm around it and it's it's out of the way of sorts, but it's also placed on the low yielding area. So you can see in this field, we've got a prairie strip that's in yellow along a tree line, along a road, a very sandy eroded slope. Another one here that intersects some old grass waterways that we no longer have because we don't need them anymore. And then a sandy corner that gets eaten, the often wildlife damage. And so we're strategically placing these um, an aerial view of a first year prairie st strip establishment in one of our fields. You can see the green going through the field with some blocks in some really sandy eroded areas. And then a picture of uh, a second year established prairie strip in one of the cornfields. In this picture, I'm standing on the sandy hill in the corner that's all prairie. And then we're looking out as the prairie strip goes through the field through a, kind of a waterway and corn on either side. Sorry. All right, my last comment. What's the challenge with prairie strips? Well, it can be weeds, right? In the foreground, I've got horseweed growing here. I know we've got Canada thistle, we've got pokeweeds and so forth that will inhabit these prairie strips along with the natives that we want. So that's kind of our challenge is to figure out how to op capture the benefits of a prairie strip and using them strategically but then avoiding the challenges that might come with weed encroachment or invasion into our fields and also potentially wildlife entry into the field that could accelerate damage. Okay, I feel like that was a lot. I wanted to get through a lot, but I think I've done it. Um, so this is my last slide, Matt. Um, I can turn it back over to you. I think we're more or less on time and do you want to, is it questions now, or do we finish this? Do you want to go through the rest of the slides? Let's, let's go through the rest of the slides. Uh, that gives you a chance to catch your breath and others a chance to write in any comments that they still have. Uh, so the first thing is, if you are on today and need a CCA CEU, uh, please email Elena Whitaker, A-L-E-N-A-W, at iastate.edu by five o'clock today and email your name, the name you entered to watch the webinar and your CCA number. So again, A-L-E-N-A-W at iastate.edu. We can go to the next slide, Brooke. Um, if you watch this webinar live and are willing to fill out the voluntary demographic survey, we would greatly appreciate it. Only one survey response is needed for all 2023 webinars. So if you've already filled one out this calendar year, thank you so much and you don't need to do it again. But if you hadn't, haven't and you're willing, um, you can either scan that QR code or go to iowalearningfarms.org uh, backslash survey. Uh, so really appreciate those that have done that and appreciate those that are willing to do it. And then the last slide to put in a plug for our webinar for next week. Uh, we have Dennis Toddy that'll talk about agriculture and climate change in Iowa and the mid Midwest, adaptation, mitigation, and decision-making. So tune in for that. So Brooke, we've had some questions come in. Let me pull this up there. Um, and the first one was, when you, noted, when you noted the yield off of 60 pounds of N, can you elaborate on how many end credits the field had from the previous year, what you had credited for, for nitrogen from uh, the cover crop and then maybe the manure as well? Yeah, that's a great question. In this particular field, we had we did do some strips um, with higher nitrogen rates actually to look, you know, starting at 60 pounds and then going upwards. And we really found no difference 
above 60 pounds of nitrogen in the field. And so we kind of came at it backwards to start asking that question, how much can we credit? Because this field had had a manure application the previous fall, a heavy red clover cover crop following wheat. And so it's it's not always straightforward. You have to do some measurements to figure that out. So the way we start by um, manure, we really look at the available amount of nitrogen that we get from a manure test combined with the lab's approach to estimating based on ammonia losses and first year availability. And that number is usually provided for you if you have a manure test that you send in. And I, we generally use it as pretty reliable. Now that doesn't doesn't help us with like years of previous applications and sort of the bank we're building up in the soil that's just the year of. And so as you go back in time, it gets a little harder to figure out what is my soil capable of? Because that's gonna change over time as we build the bank. In terms of legume cover crops, um, we credit anywhere from zero to 100 pounds of nitrogen per acre, depending on how much biomass we have at the time of termination and what the, the species or the species mixture is. In our LTAR project, where we're just starting, like in the first few years of a transition from a conventional management to this aspirational system, we're crediting 60 pounds, or this year we credited 60 pounds of nitrogen from our um, from our cover crop. And then additionally, we've credited 30 pounds of nitrogen from our um, manure application as well. So we, anyway, to get the long story, we came to 90 pounds of credit for this year. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, next one, have you done a carbon or nitrogen budget on the aspirational rotation versus the business as usual rotation? Not yet. Um, that is, uh, I haven't talked about metrics and what we're measuring, but we are planning on measuring all of those things in terms of, you know, nitrogen, water, carbon, um, you know, greenhouse gas fluxes and so forth. So that over time we can build a data set and make those uh, summaries. And I think the beauty of this project is it's long-term and to answer some of those questions, we need long-term data. So I don't have an answer yet, but yes, we are. That's part of what we're going to be doing over the next decades, hopefully, as we go through this project. Great. I guess uh, there was kind of related to that. How long has this study been going on? This particular study is only in its second year this year. Okay. Um, we do have another experiment here at the biological station that's in about its 35th year that compares no-till and cover crop systems to conventional. Okay. And so we have some early learnings for more individual practices uh, in that project. And then this one, we're kind of like throwing all of the practices we have at our disposal okay. into one pot. Okay, cool. Um have you uh, tried relay cropping cereals with the soybean and why or why not? So we have not done that here at the biological station. I have colleagues and farmer friends that have done a little bit of it. Um, we've only double crop soybeans after harvest and typically wheat comes off kind of too late um, to get it done unless we harvest a little bit early. It's like July 10th is about the cutoff date where we can plant afterwards. Our experience with relay cropping is that a, I mean, sorry, my observations and, and what I've learned from others that have done it. A, you do reduce your wheat yields and the soybeans aren't a guarantee, be, primarily because of water competition. Uh, we do have kind of sandier soils and when the wheat's really growing, it can really outcompete the soybeans. And so taking the risk of maybe I get soybeans and the known of having less wheat yields, um, we haven't really adopted it. Plus, we don't have the equipment to quite do it well. So okay. that's a that challenge actually, too. That, that's, that's like you're, uh, you're teeing up these next questions because there are a couple of questions somewhat that kind of follow on two things that you said. The first one is, uh, what's the annual rainfall that you, you um, generally get in that area? Yeah, we get a lot of rain um, in the in the spring and the fall, but we do get on average um, three inches per month or so. I think it's something like 37 inches per year. Um, so it, it's pretty like on average, it's spread out across the year, but almost every year we have like a six week period where we get little to nothing. Okay. And it seems to vary when it comes during the growing season. Um, rarely do we get a year where we get, I mean, Iowa, same thing, right? You have those drought 
I think our soils are, are well drained and we struggle a little bit more to maintain moisture during those periods. But in an ideal year, in an average year, which never happens, it's perfect here. Michigan's yeah. great. <laughs> yeah, right, right. We could just have that. Yeah. So, and then the other one was about the harvest equipment. How many types of harvest machines or heads uh, does this five-year cycle need or use? Great question. Um, all the grains are harvested with the same combine, uh, the canola and wheat and soybeans. We all use the same head, although canola would benefit from having a little bit gentler head, but we use just, just a normal auger head for all those three crops and a, a corn head for the corn. And then for the forage crop, we just use a typical forage, you know, disc mower harvester. So you, to add that into your rotation, when you're do, doing forages, you do need to add forage equipment or hat or contracted out or something like that but everything else is just done with a combine and I will add that one of our potential long-term visions is to take that perennial out of the system and add another grain crop once we feel like we've got our soil health bank built up okay. you know well enough yeah um and potentially add you know another cover crop forage in there as well so something to think about adapting over time to maybe add more grain value to the system but we wanted to build our soil bank first okay. and perennials are a great way to do that. Okay. The next one, um, has there been any uh, economic analysis done on the aspirational work versus the conventional system? That's a great question and a question we get asked a lot. And yep. what we're hoping to do is every year at the end of the year, basically have a data set that shows the costs and, and profit from each of the systems and all of the crops. So the first year last year was a little bit of a hybrid year where we were starting from business as usual and going into aspirational. And so we had some unique things. And so we haven't published that and it, it's, it's kind of out of context, right? So we did do the analysis for the corn and soybeans, but um, it's a little bit out of context. So I don't have those numbers to share. Well, I will tell you that even going corn on corn with no-till and aspirational, we had just as much profit as business as usual. And our soybeans actually were more profitable just no-tilling them in and reduced inputs compared to the business as usual, even though the business as usual had higher yields in both um, circumstances. And that was just going straight into corn residue for both crops. So in the future, hopefully what we can do is have a web portal of sorts where we can, not in real time, but every year, put up the data set of how did these systems and crops perform economically. Yeah. Okay. Well, we can uh, be on the lookout for that. So um, this is really exciting and I think something to really look forward to hearing more of your uh, results in the future, Brooke. Um, we are, I think those are the questions. And to, to highlight again, if you need a CCA CEU, um, say that five times fast, um, CCA CEU, uh, please email Elena Whitaker, so A L E N A W at iState.edu by five o'clock today. And um, please tune in next week, Dennis Potty, uh, to talk about some of the ag and climate change and some of the adaptation and mitigation in Iowa. So with that, the virtual, any any other last comments, Brooke, I guess? I just want to thank you for having me and giving me the opportunity to share what we're doing up here. And I, I encourage anybody that wants to reach out to come visit or ask questions more, please, please do. We're here and uh, love to engage. Okay.